a very, very good Paris retailer and maker at the time. Uh, Date-wise, we were talking about 1865 on this, quite an early clock. And I'm very taken with this little one, a miniature. Again, French, rather later than the clock we've just been looking at. And this one is signed with a factory stamp of Henri Jaco. He was a very good quality maker indeed. His clocks are all individually numbered. Date on this one, probably realistically, round about the turn of the century. Both very pretty clocks by very good makers. And price-wise, um, any thoughts on that at all or not? No, I don't know what the value is. None at all? Yeah. No? Well, an early Grand Sonnery like this could uh, retail for probably in the region of 2006, 2,800 pounds. Really? And the little Jaco, rather more uh, reasonable, but still would be costing about 850 to 900 pounds, particularly with a box and key. So yeah. two lovely clocks, and I'm really glad to see that they're wound up and that you use them regularly. Well, it started about 28 years ago, and I just saw one little piece in a shop window and liked it. So I've been collecting it ever since. Have you ever been to Ireland? No, never. You have no Irish connections whatsoever? None whatsoever, no. Well, I think anybody in Ireland would have been very proud to have a collection like this because what we have here is a fantastic array of pieces of bog oak. This is basically wood that has remained water-laden for many, many, many centuries. Some of it is medieval, some of it's earlier than that. And it's incredibly hard to carve. It's like trying to carve metal. To me, this sort of little touching name on here is perhaps a gift from a young man to his sweetheart. Perhaps he was going away to search for work in America. Perhaps he might not see her again for forever. And yet he gave her a little brooch before he left. I particularly like the brooches because they, they're named, but unusual right. names, right. which I've never heard of before. But I love the scenes on the boxes. The little scenes on the boxes. Yeah. Of course, what we've got on these two little boxes are almost identical scenes. In fact, they are identical. We've got church windows, um, these great big, wonderful, sweeping, gothic church windows here and then underneath the name of the place Muck Ross which is the most recent piece you bought the harp the harp yes um, and what did you pay for that 50 pounds 50 pounds so definitely bog oak is a market yes. in which you should be some of these pieces are going to be worth 15 pounds 20 pounds um, so if you take the whole collection including and I haven't seen the pieces you've got at home obviously but I think your collection is going to be worth upwards of a thousand pounds thank you this is a wonderful object. Where did you find it? We found it in a disused cellar. In a disused uh, cellar? Yes, in a hotel that we took over. Abandoned? Absolutely, yes. Well, the best thing about it, of course, is when you turn it round, because it's, a, it's, it's an urn with a difference. It's not only a lighthouse, it's the Edison lighthouse. Yes. And it advertises Oxford. Oxford, yes, that's right. It did originally light up. Yes, and yes. beneath it you could put a heater, heater, which would of course keep the, the OXO ticking over. Yes, yes. Because of course there's no connection between OXO and Edison Lighthouse at all. No, it's no, absolute it's fantasy. Right. I mean seriously, it is actually made, it, it, it is a known advertising model. The collector would really pay quite a lot for this. I would think £300, something like that. Yes. It's a great piece. Well the moment I saw the box I thought, haha, something interesting here. And, and indeed it is, because in it is untouched a doll's house furniture whole set absolutely in pristine condition and all made of chicken wishbones with, for instance for the um, armchair you've got a double one there mm -hmm. and what's so lovely is it's, it's a, obviously a very expensive piece in its day because it's lined it's in its box and a lot of work has gone into yeah. it and it's also got a silk satin upholstery is it noticed mm. yes definitely yeah. I've never liked to take it out, I'm glad I didn't know. No. It's not having a doll's house to put it in. Well, in inevitably, if you had, we would have lost cushions and yeah. little chairs. Yeah, exactly. And um, in that condition, if we were to go up for auction, we'd be talking around 150 to 200 pounds. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Keep it even in better oh, condition. Yeah. That tiny set of doll's house furniture contrasts absolutely with the grand scale of Luton Who. There's a host of fine things to see in the house. Carpets, tapestries, mirrors, fine furniture, pottery, porcelain, and magnificent sculpture too. Literally everywhere you look, there's something of interest. The English gallery at the top of the main staircase is literally packed with fine things of the 18th and 19th centuries. 
Here, for instance, a portrait by Reynolds. Over there, one by Romney. On this wall here, a couple of Hopners, just above a Chippendale three-seater settee. And here, one of the finest pieces, I think, in the whole house, a quite remarkable glow bureau made by the firm of Morgan and Sanders in 1812. And the interesting thing about that company is that they were responsible for fitting out Nelson's cabin on HMS Victory. And this piece combines both ingenuity with great quality craftsmanship, and we're lucky indeed when we find things like that on the Antiques Roadshow. But we do have our moments. <laughs> you know, one of the really nice things about the Antiques Roadshow is that every week you see something new, and this is the first time that I've seen what are called ship's chairs. Isn't that extraordinary? Now, what was the object of having cane on one side and then a padded leather seat on the other? Well, the cane on the one side was when you went into very hot climates. And um, the leather is for when you're in cooler climates. And also that you can see the bottom there where they screw onto the floor. And they're made, incidentally, of oak, I'm told. Yes, isn't that strange? Because looking at them, they look more like mahogany, don't yes, they? Yes, and you would expect with this sort of style of chair to yes, be mahogany, yes, it's more in keeping. You but, would. And how much did you pay for them, may I ask? I bought them about 14 years ago, and I paid £25 each for them. And you don't think you paid too much for them? Well, I hope I haven't lost, anyway. Well, I don't think you have. I'm glad you're sitting down. <laughs> Are you? Because I've asked Christopher Payne about them, and he thinks that today at auction, they would fetch between two and two and a half thousand pounds. What? Really? By Jingo, you do surprise me. It's been handed down from another branch of the family, and it's had its home in Scotland until now. It's been in the family quite a long time, I think. Right. It is unusual because it's a piece of glass dating from around about 1900, probably made in New York. And it's got this sort of feathered design um, in a sort of iridescent peacock blue, uh, that rather vibrant green. Uh, and it's backed, as we can see by looking inside, by this rather vivid, mm. I suppose, tangerine mm. colour. It leaps at you, doesn't it? And the, the silver uh, is applied using an electrolytic process. Yes. So it actually builds up on the surface when it's submerged in, in an electrolytic bath. Mm -hmm. And you, you leave it in there and let it build up. Obviously, you mask out those areas you don't want to be covered. Mm. And if I was to suggest a, a prob probable maker, it would be Quizzle. They were based in Brooklyn, mm. uh, in New York. And when it comes to putting a value, it's very difficult when you've not seen mm. an, an mm. example before. But I'd insure that for the best part of a thousand pounds. Well, that's very interesting. Oh. So you keep it out on the shelf? Oh, I think so. It's no good in a box, is it? No. When did you acquire that one? That was about uh, 10, 12 years ago. Before, right. Uh, How much did you pay for it? Uh, about 600 pounds. Right? Which was interesting. Quite what I love about this is it's so heavy. Yes. But you've got to pick this one up to appreciate it. Condition is fantastic. The engraving of the arms, absolutely crisp as they were engraved. Yeah. The <clears throat> maker, of course, here, quite an interesting one for the reign of George III. In fact, with this one, we're into 1807. Right. As yeah. the date. Um, William Frisbee. Yeah. And, of course, we worked with Paul Storm, right? the beginning of, uh, of his working life. But in fact, actually, Paul Storm's an argumentative so-and-so, and that partnership oh, they broke, broke up, up. Oh. within a year. Oh. <laughs> I mean, such were the arguments. But boy, what yeah, a waste. Nice, isn't it? How much did you pay for this set? That was about a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred, yeah. right. It is actually a famous Art Deco design. Oh, nice. Right. The designer, Harold Stabler, he designed for a number of different companies. In this case, of course, it's the Goldsmiths, Silversmiths yep, Company. Yep. But I mean, for anybody wanting to acquire a piece of 1930s English silver, Stabler certainly is one of the people to go oh, for. Right. Now, whose are these? These are mine. My mum and dad bought them for me um, when I was one year old. Pair of salts, of course. Looking at them sitting there, I think straight away, about 1690, which is when the originals of these would have been made. But in this case, actually, we've got mid-19th century marks. So they're Victorian copies. But the maker is Robert Garrard. Yes. And of course, there's no point in asking what you paid for them because they were a present. <laughs> 
So what about values? Have you thought at all about present day values? No, I don't think we, we've, uh, well, we, like, we, we enjoy them, I think that's the... You enjoy, that's yeah. the most important thing. Now, I would expect those to sell today for at least 500 pounds. And you should certainly insure them for an in, in excess of a thousand. Now, this one costs you £600. Yeah, yeah. It's such a wonderful example that I could see that easily today going in excess of 1500 at auction and would not be in the slightest bit surprised if it sold for over 2000 Really? Good Lord. <clears throat> and the Stabler, now that was £200 yes, yeah, 10 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Right. Well, I think you can quite easily add another naught to that today. Right. <laughs> So that, that's done better than this has? Over the last 10 years, Art Deco has become very popular. The one thing that strikes everyone who visits Luton Hill is the great number of clocks in the house. The whole place is full of them. But you know, you still need a decent watch because they all tell different times. French clocks, German clocks, Renaissance clocks, mantel clocks, and so on. Large and small, marble or brass, they all seem well suited to the scale of the room in which they're placed. Last week, Simon Bull talked about some of the clocks here at Luton Hoo. Here he is again, talking this time about a rather nice Queen Anne period marquetry long case clock, which came into our Colchester Roadshow earlier this year. Well, I suppose if one wanted to be picky in an ideal world, you'd say, wouldn't it be nice if it was six or eight inches smaller? Very much so, yes. It, uh, the houses these days are not built to accommodate right. clocks like this, I regret. But it's a sort of absolute classic um, Queen Anne period marquetry when the, when the houses were taller. Indeed. Um, it's the three train, of course. Yes, indeed. And uh, well, three, instead of the usual two winding holes for hour strike and time, you've got a third for the quarter Quartier. strike, which is what, on six bells? Is it? Six bells. Yeah. Yes. Elliot's a good second division maker, I think 1700-ish. Uh, yeah. And the case may have been French polish at some time, but it's all original. And so often you see a clock in the shop, and there's not a mark on it. And you wonder to yourself, is it really 400 yeah, years old? Yeah. But if we start here, you've got cracks both yes, sides indeed. in the marquetry, where obviously the joint is made between the top and the side bar. Yes. And the wood, of course, moves in different directions, depending on which way the grain is, is pointing. And so it's cracked, and it's moved out. And exactly the same thing's happened on top of the door. It's actually... Yes moved out and the crack has opened up across there uh -huh, yes. and you've got the same situation at the bottom of the door the crack again and then going down the base which is obviously made of two panels of wood yes we can see that it's actually cracked straight across the middle and small bits have come out and have been replaced yeah. and so yeah. often you can see nothing it, it's got a feel-good factor about exactly. it yes, yes. yes quite valuable mm. um three train i suppose i'd have to say something like Approaching ten thousand pounds. Really? Mm. Wow, that's quite a quite an impressive. Uh, it was bought in auction uh, in 1953 for 101 pounds. So. 101. Yes. Uh, well, the, somebody's uh, done all right. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> These are all Regency, but before that, in the times of the um, 17th century times, you'd often have um, small locket compartments that would contain something that looked like tissue paper. And in fact, that was human skin. So with the morning theme, it was something that went through for literally 300 years. And you'd have all sorts of different things set inside them. And the value for a garnet brooch like that, which was made in about 1795, is probably round about £120. A small one like that, which is just plain gold embossed with flowers, that's only worth around about £40, £50. These are rather nice where you've got this very, very finely plaited hair in a chandelier form. Now, the style of this, with this sort of tapering drop, was made in around about 1795, and it's very, very fine brown hair. And that's one thing that should be said about hair, is that it will not deteriorate as the years go by. It will last for literally hundreds of years. Now, as a collection, it's wonderful to see so many pieces, obviously over a period of 30, 40, 50 years. And as a group, it's more valuable simply because there are so many of them. My husband was an articled pupil to a firm of auctioneers, and he was asked to make up a set of chairs for an antique dealer. And he managed it's to got find... the beginnings of a terrible story. ...the two missing links, and it made up a superb set of chairs. 
Right. And the antique dealer was so delighted, he told my husband that he could choose anything from his shop. Somewhat risky. Somewhat risky. And to the antique dealer's dismay, my husband chose this vase. How interesting. What a wonderful story. Why does nobody say that to me? Please come into the shop and choose what you like. Exactly, anyway. Exactly, exactly. Well, they, they are in fact Japanese, not Chinese. Japanese, um, yes. They are very typical of Japanese design. They all date from about the same period. These are late 19th century. This one is early 20th century. Oh, they're yeah. not even very yes. old. I mean, yes. these are yes. barely in proper barely terms antiques. an antique. Mm. We've got burns uh, in branches. This is an aventurine ground, this sort of speckly look, named after aventurine quartz. Yes. I think you've also been polishing them, haven't you? I did, yes, yes. Mm, uh, well, we don't do that. Mm. Bit naughty, that one. They'll soon cloud over again. Well, they will. Sure. It, honestly, Clazoni, the collectors are neurotically fussy, mm. and they like things to be in the most perfect condition, just like they were made. It actually makes very little difference on this pair of vases. And they're worth somewhere around um, four to six hundred pounds for the pair. For the pair. For the pair. Yes. This one's, as I say, later. It's also finer, much more meticulous work has gone into putting the little silver wires, the croissants there. Yes. Um, brilliant enamelling. And it's very clever the way they've got this change of colour and tone going all the way down through the mm. bottom. Now, the, the real point about all this is that this is made by one of the leading um, Kazone manufacturers at the beginning of the century, a man called yes. Namikawa Yasuyuki. Namikawa Yasuyuki. Um, and his pad mark is on the bottom here, and it says Kyoto uh, Namikawa really? on this little silver pad. Yes. Um, he was the only manufacturer to do this form of marking quite mm. like this. Um, anyway, all that put together, um, this piece is going to be worth somewhere between uh, two and a half and three and a half thousand pounds. Is it really? Ni nice little sort of selection, wasn't it, really? Yes, it, it was indeed. What a day. Right. Yeah. Thank right. You. right. This, I think, is miscellaneous. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before my mother and father got married, they bought the house in Stretford, outside Manchester. Oh, right. And this was in it, along with other antiques. Uh, well, I would say that it was made in Manchester, almost certainly. Would it's it? exactly what one would expect for yeah. a, a big, major provincial city in England yeah. of about 1880. Yeah. Uh, made of mahogany, very oh. nicely made. I just think this is so nice. Even the shelves are nicely detailed. Mm. I like the way the glazing's done, very nice indeed. It just is a big, majestic piece of furniture. What do you think it's worth? I haven't a clue. I really haven't. I'd have thought it's going to cost you getting on for 3,000 pounds. Oh to buy that in an antique shop is today. Is really? Gracious me. And the idea is that when you've been presented with it, if your, your grandfather yes. was, was made an honorary mandarin, which is an extreme yes. compliment, he, this is the sort of thing you would give somebody at that stage. Yes. It, it becomes a sort of an official swagger stick. And uh, when you are holding audience or you're conducting a council or a meeting or sitting as a judge, you sit with your rear sector like this in a position of authority. So um, it's made out of a terrifically fine piece of jade. Um, with Buddhistic emblems, you've got a lovely Buddhistic endless knot motif there, Buddhistic flower, and all the other ornaments, including the wheel at the bottom. Uh, and then the very top of the head of the piece, uh, you've got further Buddhistic emblems underneath the canopy. Now, the jade itself is highly valued, so I'm going to have to think of a, of a reasonable sum to put on it. One thing I will say is that um, it started off life as a back scratcher. Yes. The Rui, the Rui <laughs> scepter was initially a sort of a, a royal instrument that you sort of go down, yeah. down the back like this with. But I don't think you would do it with a fine piece of jade. Fabulous object. Um, at auction, could fetch between five and eight thousand pounds. It won't go to auction. <laughs> it's a family heirloom. Of course it is. Judging by the tremendous response we've received from you at home in recent years, our Antiques Roadshow competitions have been very popular. So I can't think of a better place to introduce this year's competition than here in the garden at Luton Hoog. The subject of wine can be rewarding in a number of ways. Drinking it, of course, the cultivation of the vine and the collecting of wine-associated antiques. 
and it's those collector's items that are the subject of this year's competition. Of all things associated with the enjoyment of wine, among the most uh, elegant, I always think, are wine coolers, John, and these are two particularly good examples. Yes, they are. Both slightly different, as you can see in appearance and usage, but basically for serving wine, cold or chilled, which was something that was done in England in as early as the 17th century. Now, these were both from the mid-18th century, 1750, 1760. This one, as you can see, an open tub, purely for serving it cold. This one, however, has a lid and a lock, and believe it or not, we'll actually take a, a bottle standing up mm -hmm. inside. Also has a metal liner, so you put ice in that as well, but when you weren't using it for that, you weren't serving, you weren't in the dining room, you could lock it in, close the lid, lock it in, and it kept it perfectly safe as well. So they're both known as wine coolers. But this one has a specific and descriptive title. And that is the subject of our first question. What is the specific name given to that wine cooler? The second part of our competition next week, question three and more details of how to enter the week after that. Oh, and the prize is well worth winning. A weekend for two in Dublin, plus two and a half thousand pounds to spend on antiques of your choice in the company of one of our roadshow experts to help and advise you. Also, there are three runner-up prizes of £500 and that same Dublin weekend. So, well worth having a go. I was born on my great-grandmother's birthday, so my mother gave it to me when uh, my great-grandmother died. Uh, well, I must say I'm rather impressed by this watercolour. In my opinion, it's definitely by one of Queen Victoria's um, greatest seascape painters, Clarkson Stanfield. Uh, he was born in 1795, and he, he was an extremely important scene painter. Before he was press ganged into the Navy, age 19, he stayed at sea for really quite a long time. Before uh, he managed to escape uh, uh, through uh, injury and um, went to London and painted in the 1820s, exhibited in the 1820s at the Royal Academy, and in fact became the most important theatrical scene painter in, in England at the time. And with this history and knowledge of the sea, and with the influence of people like Turner, who also loved the sea, he became this extraordinary painter. And this is an exquisite English watercolour. I mean, very, very fine painting. I mean, can you imagine being up here in the rigging during this f firefight, as it were, where presumably this English ship is breaking through a, a, a barricade of two French ships? It's not often we see such fine quality watercolours by uh, the best artists. It has suffered a bit. Yes. I mean, was it uh, you reglazed it or what? Because there's no, been quite a lot of suffering up here. Um, I don't remember anything. I just remember it hanging above the piano, and really nothing's been done to it at all. Well, at some stage, I think it's th somehow it's got too close to the glass, and it has suffered here. This is damp, but uh, it would be well worth restoring and touching in. I would say somewhere around three to five thousand pounds. <laughs> wow. Well, this is a wonderful scratch-built locomotive. Yes. Uh, who built it? My husband. Your husband? husband. Right. Yes. And there's a plaque here. Uh, it says built 1956 to 1960. That's right. It took four years. It's a beautiful Everything. piece. It really is well made, exquisite. Made. It's a three and a half inch gauge, That's um, and it's a 1 16th model. I see. It's based on uh, Nigel Gresley, First Pacific. Oh, uh, yes. class locomotive and Girl. the detail is tremendous it's accurate in virtually every single aspect Lovely. you can see inside here the, the the beautiful detail of the controls yes does it have a boiler certificate not at the moment not at the moment but it has had you yes. need to get a boiler certificate for it because it yes. makes it more valuable and in fact have you ever had it valued you haven't well um i think today something like this would probably be worth in the region of between three and five thousand pounds. Oh, very nice. Yes. It's a wonderful, yes. wonderful object. Did you buy it? No, my auntie gave it to me. Yes? Yes. Well, yeah. It was a jolly nice present. And so, have you any idea about it at all? No, only that it's Cartier. Mm -hmm. Right, well it certainly is Cartier. It's uh, signed on the dial. And it's called a, a lapel watch or a fob watch. It used to be worn there like that. And it's really a sophisticated and beautiful piece of jewellery in typical deco taste, made in the 1920s or 1930s, with natural pearls, diamonds, rose diamonds. Jewellery of this period is an enormous demand, and especially anything by Cartier. 
and I would say that the if you went to replace this in a good West End shop, I should think it would probably be costing somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand pounds. High values like that one at Truro are not all that common at road shows and normally only apply to single items. Building up a great collection such as that of the Werner family at Luton Hoo is impossible without the backing of a considerable fortune. These rooms at the front of the house are devoted to the most fabulous collection of English porcelains. The collection was formed by Sir Julius Werner's wife, Lady Ludlow, and this particular room is devoted to Bow and Chelsea. Even a casual glance shows that Lady Ludlow, in common with many other collectors in the 1920s, liked the most colourful and highly decorated pieces from the Chelsea factory in particular. By far the biggest single factory represented here is Worcester. In fact, Worcester porcelains fill the whole of this room. You know, you could lock Henry Sandon in here for a week and he wouldn't even try to escape. Worcester porcelain often turns up at road shows, but just lately we've been privileged to see some things that wouldn't have been out of place here at Luton Hoo. I know that yes. Hugo Morley Fletcher oh, would probably right. agree. Now, most Worcester porcelain was decorated at the factory, but this particular group was actually decorated in London by a decorator called James Giles, mm -hmm. who bought in porcelains from other factories and decorated them himself. And he was a particularly good decorator, and you could see his skill to great advantage inside this cup. I think there's the most delightful detail here. There's little blue enamel spray, and then the uh, swags in turquoise and black, and in, in, in beautifully chiseled gilding. How did you come by it? It was, uh, my grandfather was a collector, and it was handed down first to my mother, and then when she died, to myself, my brother. Um, some of it is also with my aunts as well, so it was divided up. Yeah. Well, it is a really exceptionally interesting group. Very valuable, these are. And I would think that's worth 12 to 1500 pounds. That, even with the repair, is worth probably 500 pounds. That's worth another five to 700 pounds. And a collector would love to have that saucer or no saucer because it's so beautiful and the inside is really superb so you're probably going to still get 300 pounds for those two mm -hmm. but this is is lovely i mean i'm really uh, most excited to see this because it, it is one beautifully decorated and it is in superb mm -hmm. condition mm -hmm. such a pretty dial it's known as a butterfield dial because most of these small octagonal dials were made by a gentleman called Butterfield, but this one is made by Sevin, and there's the name on the bottom. And also, what you always find on these dials are the, the names of the cities that people would most often have visited. Mm -hmm. What is exquisite about these dials are the, the detail, for instance, on this gnomon here, there's a little bird which indicates with its beak the different latitudes the they? latitudes yes. yes and the plumage on the birds beautifully chased mm -hmm. now where did it come from well my husband bought that one yes because he he was an antiquarian horologist and he collected dials mm -hmm. yes it's very very nice that would have a value of between perhaps 600 and 800 pounds mm -hmm. there's only one thing that concerns me have you cleaned it yes do you think that was the right thing to do? <laughs> well, it was in such a disgusting state. <laughs> was it? If you can resist cleaning mm -hmm. for the next 150 years, and you might... And even if it's almost black, it's actually, leave it. I would always really? recommend to oh, leave yes. it. Because, of course, every time you clean, you're taking a minute layer off. Yes. How, how long has it been in the family? Only eight shows. And how did it get to you? They were okay. Quite fantastic. What a wonderful gift. Yes. Well, not only have you got a splendid vase, you've got the stand that was seems to have been made for it originally. There are two. There are two. There are two. And, and the other one has its own table exactly, as well. Exactly the same. Um, painting of this quality is associated with Vienna in particular. And they were obviously intended to really show themselves off. Uh, because all you have to do is rotate the vase on its own spindle 
and we're taken through the scene of classical gods arguing in preparation for the Trojan War. Um, and they are fantastically well painted. Yes. And then the ground color has been filled in with this wonderful matte gilding, yes. which has then been enhanced with wonderful Rococo scrolls in, in between. Yes. I mean, to produce something like this would take many firings, mm -hmm. maybe 10 firings at least. And the painter uh, has actually signed his name down in the bottom here, Fall, uh, and his work occurs on some of the famous uh, Vienna plaques that one gets, uh, and some of the dishes as well. Now, a pair of these uh, would sell in today's market for somewhere between 12 and 18,000 pounds, which is not bad for a gift, is it? No, it's not bad for a gift at all. It's very nice indeed. That beautiful vase brought to our Shropshire Roadshow would certainly not be out of place at Luton Hoo, although it isn't the sort of thing that you'd find in the last room we're going to see. In the Queen's bedroom, your eye is immediately taken by the quality of the furniture, and in particular, the bedroom suite itself, made in this beautiful painted satin wood. Bedside cabinets, dressing table, washstand, chairs, in the Adams style, all of this was made by Holland and Son and exhibited at the Paris Exhibition of Modern Art in 1878. And who wouldn't have the most restful time surrounded by furniture of this quality? Who indeed? Well, no less than senior members of our own royal family. And it's known as the Queen's Bedroom for a very good reason. Both the Queen and Prince Philip were great friends of the Werner family, and they used to come here to Luton Hoo to celebrate their wedding anniversaries, the first in 1948, and they continued coming here until 1977, when Lady Zia died. Portraits of Lady Zia and other members of the Werner family feature prominently in the house, still keeping a watchful eye on their impressive collections. In contrast, there couldn't be a more obvious difference between the rooms at Luton Hoo and the humble interior depicted in a small painting that was brought into our Colchester Roadshow. One of the particular things I absolutely love about this painting is that it's by an artist, William Snape, who, quite frankly, is not very well known. Um, and the picture, though, is so very, very good. Wonderful detail in it. Has it been hanging on your walls for a long time? 15 to 18 years, I should say. I particularly like the treatment on the back of the door where the lights come through and the paintwork's lifting off the wood. And here again, we've got a good bit of flaking. Here, I, I think, had you ever thought what they might be? No, I hadn't. I thought they might be uh, mice, mouse traps mouse traps, or that's what I think. rat traps or something. Yes. And possibly looking at the size of the cat, which is kind of well fed and well looked after. Perhaps he wasn't capable of doing the job which the traps would do. It looks particularly comfortable. And of course, the man there preparing wood for a fire, is that what you thought? I think so. Yes, and as I said at the beginning, for somebody who's not very well known, it's, it's wonderful to come across a picture which is, you know, so colourful and so interesting in all the detail it represents. But I think with it cleaned, and I think it could be gently and should be gently cleaned, that it'd probably be worth between three and five thousand pounds. That's a guess. <laughs> But these things are a bit older than him, aren't they? Yes, I, yes. I weren't. Are, are they yours or...? No, I've actually brought them for a friend. Yes. They really are quite, quite wonderful things. They They're virtually all Worcester, I suppose. Um, this teapot is absolutely splendid, isn't it? I see it's marked under the... Someone has had a stab at putting Loudon's Bristol, um, which, in fact, it isn't. Uh, at one time, everybody used to think these very early Worcester pieces were made at Bristol, but this one is undoubtedly a, an early Worcester one, a wonderful shape, I mean a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful shape, and with these wonderful panels with um, these strange little chinoiserie characters on them, looking Chinese, but of course they're, they're Worcester people really, <laughs> <laughs> pretending to be Chinese, I think they're marvellous, made around about 1753 or 4, and uh, this little can, this is for drinking coffee, a lovely little coffee can, again made in Worcester, although here again someone has had a stab at putting Bristol decorated under the glaze, they, they, they note there. Um, for a long time these things were thought to be Bristol, but we now know that they were actually produced at Worcester. As I found them in the excavations when I did excavations on the original factory site. Absolute proof. This particular shape is what's called the Scratch Cross family shape, 
where the base comes out at the bottom like that and if one looks very carefully I think there is a scratch a scratch mark in there in its normal place usually opposite the handle we don't know what it was for but it's a very Worcester characteristic not found on any Bristol pieces um, the Bristol factory finished in 1752 and um, so far as one knows at present they would never have made that particular shape nor would they have made these gorgeous little um, coffee cups they're, they're beautiful shapes lovely little eight-sided shapes aren't they and uh, they're gorgeous this one again says soft paste Bristol which is quite wrong as far as one knows Bristol never made any enamel decoration uh, right. they've only made blue and white so that's positively Worcester as all these coffee cups are and this one is the most spectacular of the lot I suppose this is um, a pattern called the Hope Edwards pattern with these cornucopias of claret with fine gilding and usually painted with sliced fruit very typical of the work of James Giles in London the interesting thing about it I, it comes from a great collection called the Rouse Lynch collection I knew the owner of that, Tom Byrne, until he died some years ago. He had a marvellous collection of, of what he all, always thought was mainly Worcester. Um, and in fact, this does say Worcester. But um, looking at it very carefully, um, the shape is not a Worcester shape, but more like the Carfley factory shape um, in Shropshire. Not too far from here, of course, across the river from um, Coalport. Uh -huh. And um, the shape of foot is very typically a U-shaped section. If it were Worcester, it would be a triangular section, a V-shaped section. So that is now a Carfley um, milk jug uh -huh. decorated in London by Giles, which is terribly unusual. I suppose one's looking there. Well, I suppose nearly all these pieces, all these pieces are well into four figures each. I mean, the, um, the milk jug, <laughs> let's have a stab at about sort of 4,000 pounds or something like that. Um, the little coffee cups, um, I mean, one can reckon on 1,000 pounds happily a piece for them. And the teapot, which is, I think, the gem of the whole collection, I don't know, 4,000. So, Good if you persuade your friend to let you have them for the boy, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be a very happy chap when he grows up. <laughs> when I was a baby, my parents put me in one of these. Not quite as nice as this one, but this model, this Victorian mahogany swinging crib. Absolutely lovely. And it's got its original upholstery inside. Yes. Which mine didn't have. I remember, because I could see through. I should also tell you that, of course, being a dealer, my father sold it as soon as I grew out oh, of mine. So, yeah. so is this a family one? Yes. Came down the line to my daughter. My daughter was overseas at the time, so I'm looking after it for her. Oh, right. The model was actually illustrated in several pattern books from the 1860s. Yes. So that's really when it would date from. Yes. Um, you establish that by the pattern of the turning here, which does give it that Victorian feel, and also the sort of standard or cheval ends. But it's such lovely condition. All the basket work that one can see is absolutely perfect. And of course that end with its sort of gothic shape hood to it is absolutely stunning. And look here, you even got this lovely shaped bracket here with its original gilding on. Very important, very nice to see. So many of them, because they're fragile, have been damaged over the years and therefore to find one complete is really quite rare. You really should have it covered, even temporarily in the household insurance policy for two and a half thousand pounds. Yes, thank you. It's all right? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Absolutely lovely. Yes. Quite strong memories for me. Well, I very much hope you've enjoyed this second visit to Luton Hoo as much as we have, and, of course, the opportunity to see moments from previous Antiques Roadshows in this series that otherwise we might not have been able to show you purely for reasons of time. We're off now to Scotland, to the capital of the Highlands. I very much hope that you'll join us at the same time next week. Until then, from all of us here at Luton Hoo, goodbye. The Antiques Roadshow regrets that it cannot give any valuations by post.